The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Andy Duncan, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to another Gold Money Foundation podcast uh, with me, your host, Andy Duncan, from the Austrian Economics uh, Research Conference here in Auburn, Alabama at the Mises Institute. Um, Today I'm with Professor David Howden, who who is from uh, St. Louis University in Madrid in Spain. He's also the author, along with Philip Bagus, of a book called Deep Freeze, which I think is the definitive book about Iceland's economic collapse. Hello, David. Hi, Andy. Now... The Euro. Let's just go big. (laughs) We're we're currently in interesting times because as we're speaking, we're just before the uh, the Cypriot vote. What do you think of the the Euro at the moment? Uh, Well, I think uh, sometimes I don't know what to think. In the short term, I think that it will hold together. Um, Cyprus notwithstanding, I don't think it's going to have a major effect on on the short term, uh, one year, two year course of events. In the long term, I think that this is a signal of greater cracks to be formed later. Yeah. So uh, what about the long term then? When are these cracks going to show up? It's interesting because we've been, it's it's such a broken record that keeps going around and every new country that forms, every new country that enters crisis removes one country from what was the previously stable core of Europe. I don't know if you could consider Cyprus ever part of the stable core of Europe. But uh, it's a sign that countries that we once thought were not problematic are increasingly becoming more problematic. And it's yeah. only really a matter of time until you expand this list out to include who's next, Belgium. Yeah. And then, okay, Italy's going to get worse. And before you know it, you've got France tossed in the mix. And it's, Cyprus is not significant on its own because it's, it's fairly small and inconsequential in that, in that sense. Uh, but it's significant in the sense that it signals to other countries that they've got problems. Yeah. Now, we don't know how the vote's going to go because, we, we, as, as we're speaking, we haven't got to that yet. But is the cat out of the bag now that the EU considers all people's bank accounts within its jurisdiction as, as open to, to confiscation at their, at their whim and pleasure? I think that's a, a good way to look at it. And there's precedent for this as well. Italy did a deposit tax in 92, I believe it is. Uh, Europeans, if if... Cypriots have their banks, uh, their deposit accounts taxed. It's a fairly clear sign that this could happen to anybody. Uh, it's for this reason I actually don't think that in the end Cypriot bank accounts are going to have this deposit tax put on them, at least not uh, under a certain limit. I'm pretty yeah. sure that just regular depositors and the bulk of voters are going to be spared from this and that they'll set a limit uh, at 50,000 euros yeah, it might, or maybe a little lower. It might be the deposit insurance limit, maybe 85,000 that, euros That's what I think would be more reasonable uh, from a political standpoint. Yeah, th- then they won't have uh, people beating beating up politicians in the streets <laughs> anymore. Now, uh, with, with all of these global currencies, we, 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 we seem to be having a kind of less ugly competition where the euro is uglier now than the dollar, so people might even go into the dollar. Um, how, what do you think um, is going to happen to something like the dollar over the next few years? That's a good point because I've, throughout this crisis, I've taken the stance that no matter how bad things are in the States right now, they are almost an order of magnitude worse in Europe. And every time the crisis intensifies in Europe and people are looking to rush into a safe haven, where are they going to go when there's very few options? And Germany as safe as it is, and in many ways maybe safer than the States, is not a deep capital market compared to uh, the American treasury market. Uh, Germany as a market is is not safe in the sense that it's exposed to a lot of euro risk. So paradoxically, perhaps, the worse things get in Europe, the better things get, at least from from, uh, U.S. treasury debt, uh, the better it gets in those markets by all these Europeans flooding into it. Yeah, so when when people are looking in the mirror in America, they're, they're going to see a beautiful face looking back at them. Yeah. <laughs> now you, you're an expert on uh, on Iceland. Well, you you wrote a book on Iceland. Uh, do you do you still follow the Icelandic situation? Yeah, more or less. And and how are things going in Iceland since they decided to 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 stop funding the banks and just uh, let the banks go bankrupt? Well, things are things are progressing at a slower pace. Uh, originally, when the banks failed. Uh, a lot of rot exited the system, and we saw a bit of a really rapid recovery that happened in Iceland. Um, now, with this recovery, there was a couple bad things that happened as well. So the IMF put on some capital controls to stop hot money flows into the country. Uh, also, 
more correctly to stop Icelanders from getting their money out of the country and having a, a huge decrease in the money supply there. Um, today, the position most accurately to describe it, I think, is that uh, these capital controls are now starting to to hurt or slow down the Icelandic recovery. Yeah. And in particular, we, we have a fear that maybe another uh, boom is being fueled because foreigners that had invested their money in Iceland now they they can't get their money out. They need to put it in something. So they're buying up real estate. They're buying up some tangible assets that they know they can't really lose. And we're starting to see uh, the seeds being sown for another real estate bubble right now. Yeah. So it's it's a situation that improved rapidly when they let the banks go under. And now some of the other interventions are starting to right. squash was, was, the recovery. Was, was this a punishment by the, by the IMF <laughs> for, for, for letting their friends in the banks go? Yeah, you'd almost think this, right? Yeah. This is... Uh, it's almost... It's a... I wouldn't call it a punishment, but it's a ploy to get people who invested in Iceland, uh, which was something that was necessary, especially in the bus to, to aid in recovery, to stop them from pulling out their money, no matter what. Yeah. So I wouldn't call it a punishment, although that's what it appears to be uh, yeah. from the outside. I, 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 and have the Icelandic government agreed to this, or was this just imposed by maybe the G20 or whatever? Uh, I'll call it agreement with, with scare quotes around it. Uh, you can be pressured into do anything. Uh, yeah, these days anyway, and and that's a that's what happened in Iceland more or less. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we if we look at, um, I mean, they're, they're not exactly twin clones, but if we look at Iceland and Ireland, who kind of went under at the same time in the global kind of financial meltdown uh, a few years ago, um, what, what, what's the situation like in Ireland? Ireland is recovering. They, I call it the tale of two crises. We've got Ireland that has a banking system that's that's too large, too over-leveraged, and fundamentally bankrupt. It fails, uh, and the banks get bailed out, and none of them uh, really collapse. And Ireland today is left with this hangover of a zombie banking system where you have all of these banks that are fundamentally no better than they were several years ago. Uh, they haven't been purged from the system, so there's no strong foundation for growth. Uh, and Ireland, despite all this, despite the fact that it has... Um, still all this rot in the system, has actually been recovering not, not too badly. And I think the real reason for this, when I compare it to Iceland, which is also recovering slowly along there, uh, I think the capital controls that went on Iceland, like we just talked about, is one of the big reasons why Iceland is not progressing faster right now. And paradoxically, maybe Ireland, by being included in the EU, was not able to put capital controls, stopping capital from going into Ireland or out with other European countries, yeah. or by extension, the rest of the world. So Ireland has had the benefit of open markets continually throughout this crisis. Uh, investors are not scared to go there under the under the fear that they won't be able to get their money out in the future. Mm -hmm. And this has been aiding Ireland's recovery, despite the fact that it's got a, yeah. a lot of So in, in my terms, the IMF punish Iceland for daring to let the banks go. Uh, and Ireland, have, um, they're, they're part of the friendly team, aren't they? So, so they've been let, let off being punished. Yeah, you could almost say that. They're, all, they're on the same side, so it's, it's uh, yeah, they escape that type of punishment. Having the banks be bailed out, I think, is punishment enough in Ireland. Yeah. There's no question. I think there's very few people who actually think, now when you compare these two countries, that bailing out banks mm -hmm. in Ireland and keeping them alive, if on life support for, for a while longer, was the correct move now in retrospect. Yeah. Now, if, if we take uh, these paper monies in, in the much longer term, uh, the dollar, the euro, the pound, the yen, and everything else, um, I, I foresee personally that the powers that be, the IMF, the World Bank, etc., will try to create a, a global paper money, an SDR or a bank or whatever you, whatever you want to call it. But what, what, do you, what do you think of my opinion there? Uh, sometimes I think that that's a real possibility, but most of the time I feel like it would hinge on America giving up sovereignty of the dollar and surrendering it over to an international consortium. And I don't think American politicians are ready to take that step yet. Yeah. So if there, was, if there was a push to a global currency and that push was instigated by, let's say, Europe or China or, or the UK getting in there as well, um, they could never do it without American involvement. Yeah. And American involvement, I really don't think, is going to be politically feasible. Not politically feasible. And, and I think it's not politically feasible, not for the normal uh, bad political reasons, but for good ones that a lot of American politicians realize we've got a pretty good deal going right now yeah. by having a, a monopoly over U.S. dollars, by having full control. And the world is, as much as America 
uh, is a debtor to the rest of the world, the world really relies on America for giving them American dollars to keep this game going. Yeah. And the crisis is a good point and a good case in point. Almost every country in the world was reliant on American uh, generosity, I'll call it, again with scare quotes, uh, to give them American dollars to make them loans. Yeah. So uh, in the very long term then, um, you're, you're in the Austrian tradition, where, where do you, th if you were a betting man, where would you say that this, this game is going to end up, even if the dollar is the last man standing? The end game is, uh, personally, I think that the game can go on for a lot longer, at least for American dollars, just due to the fact that with currencies, with your foreign exchange market, it, it's always relative. So the, the American dollar might be ugly, but it's the least ugly yeah. uh, of all the ones out there. In the final end game, and there will be an end game, is when uh, inflation occurs to the point where the dollar, if you can believe this, is worth even less than it is today, significantly less than it is today, and rates of inflation are so so high that entrepreneurs and investors aren't able to plan around them. So not, not so much hyperinflation then, just, just unplannable rates. Exactly. I don't think we need hyperinflation to have the collapse of the, of the currency system. I think all you need is a, a sufficiently high inflation rate, and I use the vague term sufficiently high because I don't know what that's going to be, uh, but it just has to be sufficiently high that entrepreneurs are no longer able to, to accurately calculate long-term what their rates of return are going to be or what their present value is. Or, or as Mises, Mises would say, the invention of money or the creation of money from, from ancient times was suddenly became a very useful planning tool because you could, you could then look at the value of everything in terms of everything else using money. But once money becomes unstable and chaotic and is continuously increasing, you can't plan with it anymore, so it loses its function. That's right, when it stops to, stops to be the common denominator so that yeah. you can compare. And we, we, you have a little bit of that right now. It is with even mild inflation, let's call it mild, of 3% of a year, it is a little bit complicated to compare present and future values. Yeah. But uh, multiply that up to 10% inflation and yeah. then add some uncertainty about what that future rate of inflation is going to be and you have a real problem calculating present value. Yeah. Um, so at that point, do you think we then, uh, I include myself here because I'm in uh, the Mises Institute at the moment, uh, do you think we then can step in as the Austrians and move to get the world to move towards a free market money? I hope so. I would. I would hope that it's evident at that point uh, when the when the dust has settled, and this will be an important part uh, in in getting a, a, a more stable monetary system. When the dust settles, to make people aware that the blame for the crisis and the blame for the recession lies in the monetary system or at least in large part lies on the monetary system, and getting the support of the masses to realize that money is much too important to be left to the hands of government, uh -huh. uh, much too important to be left to the hands of even a single private company, that we need some competition in the money market yeah. uh, to best supply something which is so fundamental uh, to the development of our society. So I, I think there is room at the table after the recession's over for a, a type of uh, drastic remake of the monetary system. Yeah. It's a good time to do it because although it's necessary, it's going to be disruptive. If you go from a, as broken as the US dollar is or as broken as the pound is, if you wanted to switch to something completely different today, mm -hmm. you're going to have to take a pretty big hit on that and entrepreneurs are going to have to really learn in a hurry how to deal with this new currency. Yeah. But if you're at the end of the recession anyway, yeah. you might as well get it all over with then. Yeah. Now we, we in the Austrian school, uh, because Austria, is, the symbol for Austria is AU, and the symbol for gold um, and the element table is AU. We, we tend to have a, a kind of reputation as being gold bugs. Um, but should we go for, say, using gold as money as our pr primary aim? Or should we just say free banking, free monetary system, use whatever you want, whatever it is, Bitcoin, silver, palladium, anything you want? I take the stance that it doesn't necessarily have to be gold, although gold has historically served us fairly well. The important thing... Uh, is that we back the currency with something which is uh, scarce, something which is uh, its flow, its yearly flow is uh, not significant compared to its its stock in existence. Gold uh, is a good example of this, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be gold. There are some proposals that have been bounced around over the years to use 
uh, baskets of goods, so a little bit yeah. of gold, a little bit so of so Hayekian copper, things. yeah, throw in plywood for good measure. <laughs> uh, this, I think, is getting a little bit complicated for the monetary system. I, I, just as a pragmatic point, I think it works best if you, if you keep it simple, yeah. and you, you're dealing with one good. And gold does do a, a fairly good job of meeting all these criteria, but I don't think it's the only good that... Yeah, foreseeably could do it. It has to be something that is its supply is managed by the forces of supply and demand, which aren't controlled by government. Mm-hmm. And also, it would help if it was uh, widely dispersed throughout the world, uh, so that it would ease adoption by uh, individuals in multiple countries or multiple places. And gold fits that bill fairly well. Yeah, many places though used to have um, silver as the currency, didn't they? China and um, various other countries. Silver was the money. Yeah, silver wouldn't. I wouldn't have a problem with silver. I don't think there's any practical reason why silver couldn't do it today either. Uh, more or less fits the same criteria as gold. Okay. Now, let's just wrap up. Uh, b- before we go, you, you've written this, uh, this a few years ago now, this fantastic book on Iceland. Have you got any more books uh, coming out? Well, uh, Joe Salerno and I are editing a book um, in commemoration of the 100-year anniversary of the Federal Reserve. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, it's uh, tentatively titled 100 Years of Folly. Uh, and that should be out, uh, well, hopefully before the end of the year, so that, or right at the end of the year, so we can hit the 100 year anniversary uh, bang on. And that more or less deals with uh, several chapters by, uh, contributed by other economists that are looking at different aspects of how the Fed has meddled over the last century and how it's bred more it's instability than it's caused. It's fantastic results. Yeah, hopefully. And uh, that's the big project that I've got on the go right now. Otherwise, a lot of uh, little projects dealing with uh, full reserve banking, the necessity to, to maintain 100% reserves, uh, in particular, uh, of po- particular interest in the crisis, how more stability would have been bred through a fully reserved banking system yeah. than uh, fractional reserves. Well, I really look forward to... Uh, to uh, oh, can we have you back on again uh, when, when your book's published? Absolutely. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> anyway, it's been great speaking to you today, David. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Andy. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.